This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. I'd also like to thank the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter for sponsoring episode 416 of the Juice Box podcast. You can learn more about that Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter at contournext.com forward slash juice box. And of course, learn more about Touched by Type 1 on their Facebook page, on Instagram, or at touchedbytype1.org. Hello, friends, and welcome to the show. On today's episode, I'm going to be speaking with Lachlan. Lachlan's from Australia, and he has type 1 diabetes. He also has a bunch of kids and a wife, and he's a teacher. Lachlan got type 1 diabetes a long time ago, so he was using like that cloudy insulin and just eating on schedules and stuff like that. And he's going to talk a lot about that today and about his transition into newer ways of managing. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I hope you will too. While you're listening, please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. I just got out of bed, honestly. So hold on a second. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> uh, it turned out to be one of those days where uh, where everybody was like, "I don't really have to start till nine. <laughs> my daughter's like, "School doesn't start till nine. I'm going to get up at eight forty five and I'm like, "Okay, and my wife's like, "I canceled my seven o'clock meeting." And I was like, "Oh, all right, so anyway, all the people who usually get up and then wake me up because they don't want to take care of the dogs they all slip in, so i I opened my eyes I was like it's it's eight forty. I gotta move." Anyway, um, but yeah, we can leave it on if you want. I just, I, it's dark in here. I don't have a whole lot of light. No, whatever you want. I'm fine. I'm easy too. It's fine. I've been, uh, I've been doing this for the last, last two months with, uh, with teaching with kids and stuff. So have you really on or off? Doesn't matter. The kids, kids Wi-Fi at home don't, that isn't normally really good. So normally just talking to a blank screen anyway. I can't believe we all have to think about this stuff now. Like, <laughs> Like how to talk to each other this way. I'll leave it on. Let's see how it rolls. It, it seems pretty stable so far. I'm recording your audio already. So, yeah, um, no worries. Before you introduce yourself, let me just finish my thought. Uh, what kind of teacher? Uh, primary school. Uh, so, I think you guys call it elementary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I teach five sixes, which is uh, age 11, 12 year olds. 11 and 12, right before they go crazy. Uh, or towards the end of this year, they start going crazy. That, that, yeah. That's what it means. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? You really do have them right at a spot where they, they're they just leaving one error. Transitioning. And, yeah, and transitioning yep. into another one. Yeah, <laughs> you're Transitioning into a lunatic is what happens if I remember myself being that age. Yeah, something like that. What, do you teach them anything? Do you have them all in one class all day, or do you have just one subject? How do you guys handle it? Yeah, so we're we're generalist teachers, so they'll they'll have a couple of hours out, give us time to do some planning, a couple of hours out to do, say, music or art. But yeah, we'll teach them English and maths and everything. My name's uh, Lockie O'Toole, a father of two. Yeah, I'm a teacher, as I said, and I'm a type 1 diabetic. How old were you when you were diagnosed? I was 10 years old uh, back in 1997. 97. 2007, 17. Just got you. Now you're, hold on, it's 2017, you're 30. And then uh, 2018, you're 31, 19, 32, 20. You're 33 years old. Yeah, at the end of yeah. the year. Yep. You're probably, yep. you probably like, oh my God, those kids I teach are, are, are way better at that than he is. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did some multiplication and a little bit of counting, and then I did addition. Really, it was a lot of my. A lot of my grammar school tools were thrown right together there. Well, I knew I knew you'd do something like that, so I had to I had to work out how old I was. I just need to know how old you are, and I find it incredibly boring to ask how old you are for some reason. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, so you're 33 now. You were diagnosed when you were 10. When you were 10, yep. it was 97. 97 exactly wasn't exactly the golden era of type 1 diabetes. And you live in Australia, which appears to be a place where American technology doesn't make it very quickly, near as I can tell. 
yeah, it, it takes takes a while, um, I think. Um, I started off, I don't I think you guys call it regular or something. I don't I, I remember it was a purple vial and yeah, a couple injections a day with the cloudy and a clear mixture. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I was on that for I reckon three or four years before I got any of that the rapid acting stuff. So in the 2000s, um, okay, in the early 2000s, yeah. What I mean, is you listen to the show? So is being diagnosed in Australia much different than being diagnosed anywhere else? Or I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I think like listening listening obviously to you to you over the last 12 18 months it, it, probably the whole podcast resonated with me with the fact that there's so many stories that I'm just like sitting back listening or or going for a walk and going yeah that that's exactly what happened to me or mm. that's you know that seems what was happening to my mum or, or or that and I'm just kind of like you know it doesn't matter where you are I don't think it kind of it, it does yeah it, I agree do you find it comforting or or not? Yeah, yeah. Um initially when I started listening, I didn't don't know exactly what I was listening while I started to listen to you, Scott, but um when I, you know start hearing some of these stories where to start, you know, some of the some of the things that I've heard before or or if things have happened to me, I, I was just like I did start to feel a little bit of a connection with with total strangers, I suppose. And, mm-hmm. and that's, you know, I suppose what kept, you know, kept me hooked throughout you know, last, last year or so. That's excellent. I, I just think that there are some people who very much want to believe that, you know, we're all individuals in a way that nobody's the same. And I mean, everybody has their individual things, but for the most part, you know, I mean, we all live in a society, you know, there's doctors and the, the steps right, are going to be right. fairly similar. And I didn't know if that, because I don't have diabetes, I didn't know if that made it comfortable or if it if it was angering to to not feel like your situation was unique. And but it's nice to know that it feels, you know, like it draws you in and it makes you feel comforted. So that's excellent. Oh, cool. Um, mom, dad, mom, just who'd you have going when you were diagnosed? Um, well, I had mom and dad at home, um, but mom mom helped with. Mm-hmm. Uh, with everything i i think right right from the start she was she went through with with me to the hospital and things like that but um yeah pretty much at the hospital i wouldn't i wouldn't let anybody jab me i I wouldn't let a nurse or a doctor or or even my mum give me an injection so 10 years old i was straight on like no i'm i'm doing this i'm i'm taking control of this and and running with it so um mum was there you know but uh, it was pretty much me from the from the get-go but in those first number of years using the cloudy um you're just really getting up in the morning giving yourself some insulin and making sure you eat at certain times was that about the extent of it that's pretty much it and i reckon that's pretty much my life until two years ago not i wasn't i wasn't using that insulin but just just giving a few jabs and and not worrying about it, not not checking. You know, I might do one one test a day if I, if I was lucky. Um, you know, didn't even really know what a, a carb ratio was until a couple of years ago. I just look at a plate and go, right, I'll do six or seven, eight units, just guess. And if I went low, I went low. If if not, I was just you know just winging it. And you know, I'm not sure exactly what the what the education was with was with mum or anything like that but you know it it was just it was just guess and check and jab and see well i grew up with a friend who had diabetes so i think you know in those first couple years for you that sounds it it mirrors his experience exactly i i can remember him thinking that little things like we're going to be more active today so he'd give himself like a little less or you know we were going to sit we're going to go to a movie so it'd be a little more but that yep. was the extent of his consideration about it. And his meter was like, you know, I don't know. It, it was like half a size of a shoebox, and it never left yeah. his house. So, and yep. he never used it and he never went to the doctor. Like there was not yep. like a, I want to make sure I'm being clear. He wasn't, a, he wasn't not going to the doctor. It was just like the idea of having an endocrinologist just for your diabetes sort of didn't exist for him. 
his, yeah. his yeah. general practitioner took care of it. And I don't know what took care of it means. It must've meant making sure he had supplies and insulin. And, and that was pretty much it. Um, but you, unlike my friend, you transitioned into uh, fast acting insulin in a couple of years. So you're saying that when you moved to what do you guys call it? Nova rapid there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Nova rapid. Yep. When you move to that, you're only like, it's so funny, right? You're, I can't believe how things work out sometimes. You're about 13 years old. We were yep. just talking about that when it started, you know. Uh not the n- not the not exactly the greatest time for boys <laughs> for, <Yeah>. for certain. <laughs> and so did you treat the Novo Rapid like it wasn't much different than the Cloudy just that it got injected at meals instead of at set times? Yeah, pretty much. When when I was introduced to that, I was actually I was one of the first, I think I was the second kid at, at well, we, we traveled um, four hours to get to the children's hospital in, in Melbourne. Um, and when we got down there one time, the, the doctor was talking about um, Lantus and, and how it was going through a trial stage at that point. It wasn't actually, you know, freely available and stuff like that. So I was like the second kid or something in that in his office that day and he was just like yep you're gonna be the second kid on the trial um i'll introduce lantus and while you're there you you're gonna be using this nova rapid stuff as well so um you know learn learning how to how to get that lantus dose right and then yeah the the nova rapid was just it was more of the same you know just look at a plate and kind of go yeah I'll, I'll about this much just, yeah, I'll just have, I'll guess this much. Looking back, do you have the feeling that you and the doctor were learning about this at the same time? Uh, I think so. Yeah. 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 As it moved in. Uh, I, I have to tell you, I'm sorry, this is going to derail us for a second, but it, if you all want to look into my mind, you said I traveled four hours to get to my endocrinologist. Immediately, I see your mother on a zebra. You have little tan shorts on and boots and a hat. You're riding on the back of a kangaroo. And um, I know that's not what Australia is. But just so you know, you're telling this story. And like in my mind, there are these cartoon characters making their way across. I don't know what the landscape was in my head. But it was a trek, honestly. You had to stop at a watering hole. It was really something. Uh (laughs) Every time you talk to to, to somebody from overseas, when we or been travel and that is suck you you say kangaroos regularly and you're like <laughs> no yeah yeah yep. you do Re- uh, no kidding like squirrels yeah. here they're just everywhere <laughs> yeah they're they're everywhere <laughs> when you, have you been to the u.s uh not the u.s no okay perfect when you imagine the u.s is it just new york city uh oh, well just just finished watching something on telly about <laughs> to bring bring down the mood mass school shootings and and all this type of stuff so no i i think of cities and everyone in america's got a gun that's what we is that how it feels to you we're just yeah. all walking around with guns see yeah, so, i think the so wild west super interesting because um i i have a you know well i have a rec- a, a realization of uh, of australia that's not real at all and yours is pretty damn accurate <laughs> uh oh, we don't no, no. we don't walk no, around pointing them. so you know it's in it, i think it is a little regional here um and by regional i don't mean state to state although it is it it might be county to county or you know like you know whatever i probably shouldn't say this out loud because people i think some people figure out who i am by now but um i've never held or shot a gun in my life i have no interest in doing it 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 isn't because of my politics i just you know but but i would be lying to you if i didn't think sometimes how am i gonna like you know defend this house if somebody comes barreling in here is it just gonna be me and a bat and maybe that's better off like I, i don't know um it just, you know, I don't know. I really don't. I know some people that have 10 guns, to be perfectly honest with you, and I can't, for the life of me, imagine what they're doing with them. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, to me, it would be like if I had 10 computers. If I had 10 computers, I'd want you to call a doctor and say, hey, I got this friend. He's sick. He's a little bit of- <laughs> Can you help him? <laughs> like, he's got 10 computers. But that's super, that's very interesting. Um, okay, so you're... So you just made a statement. I mean, you're 33 years old. You get this Novo Rapid around the time you're 13. So for 
18 of the last 20 years, you're doing what you described. You're looking at your plate and going, I don't know about this much and saying that I'll either get low or I won't. Did you, first of all, give any consideration to what would happen if you didn't use enough insulin? Was that ever part of your thought process? No, no, not really. I was never, I was never afraid of, of being low. Um, that that wasn't an issue with me. So I would always kind of go, if I looked at a plate and thought six or six units, I might go seven units. You know, it would, wouldn't worry me. I, I, yeah. I, I remember being, being young and dumb and, and being low and, and not even eating, just like just seeing how far I can push it when I was in the early teens and stuff and just sit on the couch and shake and sweat and have some jelly beans next to me. And, you know, I've never been afraid of it. So I've always kind of been probably lower than higher. Were you consciously in those moments just thinking, I wonder how long I can hold out till I pass out? Was it a game or were you incapable of getting to food or what's that like? No, no, yeah, I probably, yeah, like I said, I was just young and, and dumb and at some, I just, yeah, probably sometimes just coming home from school and just thought, I feel a little bit low. I wonder how shaky I could get. And, mm. you know, I I'd, I'd never never been unconscious or anything like that so I'd I'd probably a bit a bit chicken and I'd, and I'd, I'd lose I think it would happen damage. once you'd be like you know what why don't I eat something <laughs> Yeah well, what a, what a stupid thing to do you know I could well, say that, that is dumb pretty- Although I think 30. you probably just scared the hell out of every mother of a boy that has diabetes. Oh, yeah. They're probably like, wait, you mean that idiot stuff he does is going to translate over to this? Yeah, I'm not an idiot now, but yeah. <laughs> oh, congratulations. I stopped being an idiot a year or two ago myself. <laughs> uh, well, okay, well, that's it. I mean, it's good to know, though. It's, uh, it's not that everybody's the same, but, you know... I mean, you're just describing how I handled cutting the lawn when my dad was like, cut the lawn. I was like, I'll get to it, you you know, and then (laughs) I'd hang and hang and hang. He'd get angrier and angrier. And eventually he looked like he was going to kill me. And that's probably about when you were shaking. (laughs) I was was just testing out the waters, I guess. Uh, But, you know, what I was thinking when you said that was as much as you didn't have a system, you did because you were aggressive and not scared to get up to sweating and shaking. So you probably were looking at food, giving yourself insulin, not getting shaky and thinking, oh, I could have done more. And then going more, getting shaky and backing off a little bit. I bet you had some sort of a system, even if you weren't maybe even completely aware of it. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, I probably would have. I would have been remembering how much I'd given in a plate and not, yeah, for sure. Right, yeah, Yeah, it's not, I mean, listen, that's not a good system. You're not going to build a podcast around it or something like that. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, no, no. Hey, it's just Lachlan. I have a podcast about diabetes. What you do is you give yourself insulin. If you don't get shaky and sweaty next time, you do more. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that's not a good plan. But but for a kid, now, why? And I'm not. This is not a condemnation, obviously, because I'm trying to just figure out how it happens. Was your mom just not involved? Did she not know you were getting sweaty and shaky? Or was that just kind of thought of as part of the game, how it goes? No, it just would have been, yeah, mom could have been anywhere at, the, at that point in time in the house and I could have just been sitting watching telly mm-hmm. and, and nobody would have known. No, no technology those days with, with CGMs, with alarms and stuff like that. So she could have been walking past and not even taking a second look at me. She'd, she'd, never, she'd probably listen to this and, you're horrified now. So I don't know if I've ever told her that, but oh, she'll find out. But she'll find out. Um, well, she'll find out. I, um, how much of that do you think comes from those first few years of the of the cloudy, like of just like this? Did it set up the expectation that this is what diabetes was? Were you waylaid a bit by the fact that the doctor did not step in and say, "Hey, here's how you use this stuff. It's it's markedly different than what we're doing now." Because I don't think that your experience leaving older insulin and coming into faster acting insulin is any different than most people who lived in that space. I also don't think it's different that you took so long to figure it out. I think it's a fairly common story. But do you have a feeling for what lulled you into like just feeling like that was okay? Probably, probably the fact that um, only now realizing and, and hearing about you know the how different insulin works is is that that cloudy stuff that that makes you it takes a longer time to work so you get lower 
later on if you do nothing if you're not eating at the right time so um i I would be having lows anyway and i might even be thinking i don't know why i'm feeling like this because i gave insulin so long ago so Mm. you know maybe it was just the fact that you know that's just diabetes you get you get low sometimes you get shaky sometimes you know yeah don't worry about it eat you know isn't it interesting that just the lack of a couple of tools really made that that statement which you've heard me rail about on the podcast, you know, don't just say that's just diabetes. It's not, you don't understand how to use insulin, but in that exact time frame in history, that really was just diabetes. And the lack of a small portable meter was really the difference in your life. Like that's fascinating. Is that you or that's not Arden? I'm good over here. No, that's me. Two beeps. Where does that put you? Are you high? 7.1. I just had a cut. I just, had a couple of beers. <laughs> I was just like, uh, I'm going to wait up a couple of extra hours. I'll sit and watch them tell and have a beer. <laughs> um, what, what, seven, time, what time is it there, by the way? Uh, 11.20 p.m. Okay. I'm sorry for that, but thank you very much. Uh, nah, you're right. <laughs> uh, I'm I, I'm going to do the, I got to find my conversion chart. Um, oh, sorry. I got it. No. Uh, that's 128. 128. Oh, so you, where's your high alarm set? It's set at. 7.0 so 126 oh is that because of the podcast because if it is i'm very proud of you yeah yeah and the fact that now i've I've got a cgm and i can i can actually well that was the other <laughs> I've thing got I, something i just heard beeping from a dexcom has um i had somebody from australia on pretty recently but obviously it was recorded a couple of months prior where she was talking about not being able to get to it but has that become different recently for you guys Oh, for some it has. So uh, I think if I think the new ones, if you're over sixty years old, and if you're under eighteen, um, or if you're on a healthcare card, so if, if you're a low low income earner, you get um, the Libre or the Dexcom. I think um, fully funded. But I'm oh, I'm a working working teacher, like I said before. So I earn too much money and have to pay for it out of pocket. Well, in fairness, I can see your home and it's obvious that you have opulent wealth and your, <laughs> your health, your health should be uh, tied to that for certain. Um, I'm, I'm in a, a cupboard. I'm not making fun of, uh, of Lachlan's house. It's just, you know, there, there are no gold uh, toilets behind him as near as I can see. So um, I'll spend all my money on Dexcom sensors. <laughs> <laughs> We'd spruce this room up, but I'm trying to keep my blood sugar under 120. <laughs> no, um, well, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know that there's a perfect healthcare system anywhere, obviously, and it always does come back to money somewhere. There's not an endless supply of yeah. money or yeah. you're in a more capitalist society where people are like, hey, you could totally be healthy if you could afford it. Um, yeah. you, you know, so not for nothing, but that's, I mean, it's great that you got it. How long have you had it? Um. The Dexcom I've been on since uh, November. I tried the the Libre for about nine months, and that was that was awesome. That was a bit cheaper. Um, but then I decided that I wanted to take another step and get a pump as well. Um, so I thought I've got to get something that kind of integrates with that. And listening to you talk about Dexcom, um, Ching Ching. Let's mention your sponsors, mate. What? Um, <laughs> I hope someone's yeah, I listening. Thought, I no. can sell a Dexcom in Australia as easy as I can sell it in Missouri, just so you know, Dexcom. <laughs> the price is probably going up next year. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, so I thought I'll give that a crack. And I, I like the, the, uh, the, you know, the idea of having those alarms. I wouldn't have known I was 7 or 120 then yeah. um, unless the alarm went off. So, Well, um, what's the cost? Is it all out of pocket for you? Do you pay cash for them? Or is some of it subsidized? Yeah, so I got it's two hundred and fifty dollars. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what that's American, but well, two hundred and fifty Aussie dollars for four sensors. Okay. And two hundred and fifty dollars for a transmitter. But I've um, got onto people on social media that that can re- reset, uh, uh, rebattery the transmitters. So I'm, I'll, I pay fifty bucks for a rebattery transmitter instead. Well, I have to say, only because of the sponsorship, 
I'm very much against that. And uh, yeah. I, I think that's wrong and you shouldn't do that. That's just what I want yeah. to say real quick about that. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and I also restart the senses. So that's horrible too, but that's what I've got to do. <laughs> I, no, no, no. I um, Listen, I think you got to do what you got to do. I was just looking to that uh, about the money exchange. Looks like one of your dollars is like 70. So 70% of ours is one of yours. Yeah. I am now very embarrassed to tell you that I went through 12 years of school and I realized there's probably some very simple mathematical equation that would tell me what that amount is. Uh, and uh, I don't know what it is exactly. $180. So I would take, I would find out what 30%, what I would do here is take your cost. Let's make it round numbers. Just so, say I said $300 and I would find out what 30% of that is. And then that's what it would cost here. And so I would multiply 0.3 get 90 and subtract it or is that completely wrong that's wrong that's a third damn it hold on let's do it again three and subtract that from oh. 300 Shh, don't, <laughs> don't, don't talk don't, don't just wait all right i'm embarrassing myself i have to stop uh, my i never once in mathematics through my entire learning system did i come up with the correct answer in the right way and back then <laughs> As a dumb kid, I thought, what does it matter? I'm being tested. I have the answer. And now I realize it's a lot about how you apply it when you need it. It would be like if I stopped a car by throwing a rock out the window attached to a rope and then got into a real situation where I had to stop very quickly and thought, boy, I bet you it would have been better if I knew how to use the braking system on this car. <laughs> I, so when I need math, I'm um, I'm lost. Uh you probably none of you should probably be listening to this podcast just so you know uh but but okay so you're so you're doing that i think it's great it's tough because i imagine teachers aren't you know um any more better paid in australia than they are in in america it's not like you're you know uh, just probably walking out of the building every week waving to the children goodbye kids i'll see you later money yeah. money falling out of your pockets like, i don't know what i'm gonna do with all this money i got today for teaching you uh <laughs> so it sucks but i i love that you're doing it um i have to tell you this hasn't come up on an episode yet um but i'm wearing a dexcom right now i'm getting to wear one yeah. for 10 days right and it's fascinating in a way that i can't believe i'm saying it as if i've never seen it before um, yeah. and obviously I've been looking at my daughter's data and other people's data forever and ever, but to watch it work in a person whose pancreas is doing what you expect, it's, it's really eye opening. And, uh, I think I'm going to learn a lot so that I can talk to other people, which is, was my goal when I asked for it. Um, yeah. and, um, it, but it, it was hard at first. And, and the reason I bring it up is because as I, as I was about to put it on the first time, I thought, am I about to find out something about my health? I don't know. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, am I about to slap yeah. I'm 48 years old? Am I about to slap this on and find out I have pre-diabetes? Pre um, <laughs> am I about to slap this on and find out that my favorite meal is something I probably should never eat again? You, you know, you know, like these, the, yeah. it was, it was very, it was very interesting. And, um, and I'll tell you there's two things that have really kind of like, been super interesting about it one is and this is not a uh what we would call a humble brag this is just what's happening arden's blood sugar and mine are following very similar patterns and heights when we eat the same meals together which was incredibly comforting do you know what I mean? Like when I see her blood sugar go to I don't know, you know, 120 after a meal and then it comes back down again yeah. To see mine do the same thing took away a lot of anxiety for me because I think that when we use insulin, at least if you're listening to this podcast, uh, you're trying to stay ahead of a potential mess up, right? And yeah. the idea of 120 diagonal up, you still don't know. As much data as that is, you still don't know. Is that about to be 170 diagonal up or is it going to level and come back again? And then I think that fear makes me concerned that any rise is bad. And then I realize yep. there are some meals that we're handling better with insulin than my, than a body could handle. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger at 48 over here, but you know, at the, at the same time, I'm, I'm not dripping out of my chair, you, you know, so I'm, I'm, yep. I'm doing okay. That, that part's been really kind of 
uh, comforting. And the other thing is I find myself very, this is going to make you laugh, I hope, because it, uh, either that or, again, you might want to call somebody and say, Scott needs help. Uh, I find myself irritated at how slow my body takes care of my blood sugar. <laughs> I look and I think, I wish I could give myself insulin here. Or, so yeah, this. I would love to have pre bolus this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's been just tell you, just tell your pancreas that I'm about to eat, mate. You well, start, so <laughs> it's not working. You'll apparently, you'll probably hear this on the podcast before you hear yourself on it, but eventually I'm going to talk to Jenny about the entire experience. And I was telling her that I was texting her, I was like, I want a pre bolus. <laughs> I was like, I know that sounds <laughs> stupid. And she goes, Your body sort of does. And I said, how? And she said, and I, we'll have to dig into it more. But she said, when you smell food, your body starts to give you insulin. And I was like, get out of here. Did you make that up? I'm texting her back. I'm like, you made that up? Like, are you just messing with me? You know? Um, but yeah, I'm going to dig into that more and figure that out too. But I have so trained myself to not want to see that graph bell at all that when it happens, it makes me uncomfortable, even though I know for certain my blood sugar is going to come back down again. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting when when I got the when I got finally got the Dexcom, I still had one of the Libres left over, and I very persuasively talked my wife into wearing it for the the two weeks as well because I wanted the same type of data. And the thing I got from it was how low she went when she was fasting. Is, is she was comfortably sitting sitting around. You know, three point eight to four point zero. Sorry, I got it. Around six, sixty-eight to, okay, 70 to seventy, all night without any issues, and and that type of kind of thing. That's normal. So, you know, I would, you know, yeah, be a little bit more comf comfortable sitting at, you know, in the seventies overnight, rather than thinking, oh, I'm sitting at that. I better have a little snack before I go to bed because, you know, it's normal. Nothing bad's gonna happen. Yeah. You know? There's an old episode called. Uh... Terry lives on a boat and he was the first person that ever said that to me years and years ago. He's like, you know, there are people without diabetes whose blood sugars go to 60 and sit there for a while. They're not scared of it. First of all, they don't know it, but secondly, they're not scared of it because their, their body's not going to pull them lower than that. And yeah. it's not like they have, you know, man-made insulin in them running wild because they use too much of it. And I thought, okay, that's comforting. You, you know, like I, I took a lot from that. I actually just recently re uh, recorded a second episode with um with him and it's going to go up in a little bit. I just very much enjoyed him. I reached out into the to the listeners. And I was like, I was like, real quick, whoever says it wins first, like name an episode you really loved. And somebody came back right away. might have been a woman named Jamie. And she said, Terry lives on a boat. I love that episode. I got so much from that one. I was like, done. I'm going to record with Terry again. So I got him back. And it was really it was really, really interesting. He's a guy who pays attention. So, okay, so you, you go about your life for these 18 years, living the way you described. What happens that makes you pay closer attention? Givoke Hypopen has no visible needle and is the first pre-mixed auto-injector of glucagon for very low blood sugar in adults and kids with diabetes, ages two and above. Not only is Givoke Hypopen simple to administer, but it's simple to learn more about. All you have to do is go to gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. Gvoke shouldn't be used in patients with insulinoma or pheochromocytoma. Visit gvokeglucagon.com slash risk. You know how sometimes you're just banging around the internet looking for something to understand, learn, see, or look at? Check out touchedbytype1.org while you're doing that. And if you're not such an internet-y person, in so much as you don't like the WWWs, you can also look on Instagram and Facebook. Touched by Type 1 is my favorite diabetes organization, and I really hope you check into them. While you're out there, don't you deserve a state-of-the-art, accurate blood glucose meter? I can answer for you. You do. You do deserve that. And it's not as far away as you think. You might be thinking, oh, I have a blood glucose meter. It's right here. It works fine. Does it? Is it one of the more accurate ones available? How do you know? Well, luckily for you, well, I know that the Contour Next One blood glucose meter ranks at the very top, ranks up there with the very best of blood glucose meters. 
It's super accurate, easy to use, has a bright light for nighttime checking, and a second chance test strip. So you don't have to waste the strip if you touch the blood but don't get it off. And you still get an accurate reading when you go back in for that, that next little bit of blood. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. Learn about their meter, learn about their test strip program, and you may even be eligible for a free Contour Next One meter. Not only that, I know you're like, Scott, that's a lot already, but there's a little more. Many people may find that paying cash for the Contour Next One and the test strips is cheaper than getting your current meter through insurance. It's worth looking into. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. Touch by type one.org, gvoteglucagon.com forward slash juice box. There are links in the show notes. There are links at juiceboxpodcast.com. And of course, you can always type them right into a web browser. Let's get back to Lachlan, who's about to answer a question. What happens that makes you pay closer attention? Probably the birth of my second son. I just. I just started thinking a little bit more about the diabetes and the fact that, you know, you know it's a, I suppose runs in the family to, to some extent. And I, I was a bit, you know, I, I don't know, paternal instincts or something. I don't know what it is, but you started worrying about my, my boys getting it before they actually get it. So I was like, well, if, if it does happen that, you know, one of my sons do get it one day, I kind of wanted to know, I wanted to know something because it turns out I, I knew kind of nothing. I was just making it up as I was going. So mm. uh, from from there, I, I I just I started educating myself. I just started reading books and and I asked to uh, asked the doctor that I was seeing, you know, about CGMs, and he knew nothing. He was just like, "Here's the name of an educator. Go to go to this lady." And because I'd never been to a diabetic educator either. Um, and she was just like, yeah, these, this is a, this is what they are. This is how you get them. You know, you're gonna have to pay out of pocket for them. Um, and then, yeah, from then, when I strapped one of those on, and you know, like I said, I was, I was, I was reading books, and and that that educator kind of said to, you know, get online and and start talking to people, form a bit of community, because I never knew it. I never knew a diabetic I, I, from when I was growing up. Right. None of the kangaroos have diabetes. Uh, yeah, they might have, but they don't <laughs> they don't say much. So, <laughs> well, that's going to be a problem. There are no you can't form a community with a bunch of kangaroos that won't talk to you. That's for certain. Uh, well, well, so a couple of things you said there are interesting. The the one that really sticks out to me is that even when you went to a doctor and you're like I have to do better at this, they said, "Here, we'll take this technology and then go online and find somebody who can help you." Like, was there any part of you that was looking at them like you're the person you're supposed to be helping? Me? Well, first I went to my doctor and asked him about it, and he was—he gave me to somebody else who, you know, who was supposed to know. About it. And she, she did know things about it. It was just the fact that, you know, to, to get more information that you want, you know, from I only had my short, yeah, short appointment time. You know, get online and, and start talking to people um, and, and find things out. So those poor doctors must have PTSD by the end of the day in the week. Just, you know, <laughs> 20 people asked me for help today. And I said, uh, I don't know, you know, we only have 10 minutes together. Have you tried online? Goodbye. Like, you know, they must feel <laughs> terrible sometimes when it's over. Um, when you put on, you said you went with the Libre first, when you put that on, what'd you learn? Uh, spikes, spikes. I is the, just how high I went um, after eating and then not, not panicking, but just kind of go, oh, I didn't realize that maybe I, I didn't give him enough insulin and then I'd give more insulin. Mm -hmm. And then the insulin that I gave to start with would catch up and then I'd get really low later. So it was the fact that I was, I was mistiming. It was, it was, it was the old adage of uh, yeah. pre-bolus times and um, which I didn't know anything about it at that at that period so i was having lots of spikes going up to 14 15 14 or 15 around. uh 260 270 yeah and okay. then coming back down and 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 that type of stuff so how low were you getting uh i i could get well into the twos into the 40s yeah regularly oh so yep. even some it's of your awesome. a1c do you remember what your a1c was in that time oh yeah i i <laughs> Every time I went to the doctor, and I still went every 
three months, six months, ever since I was diagnosed, I never never didn't go. It was mm. always in mid sevens. If it would, if so you were, my weights. Uh, so you're in the mid sevens. Yeah. And your but your blood sugars are regularly forty and regular two hundred regularly two hundred and eighty. So your deviation's so far off that the A one C is sort of meaningless. Yeah. So the doctors always said you you're doing okay, you're doing fine. Here's your scripts, off you go. So and I, I just took them as as right. I'm doing fine. I don't know anything what I'm doing, but what I'm doing is fine. So. Well, you may or may not enjoy the episode I put up last night. So I had a a, a doctor who works for Dexcom. His name is John Welsh. And I, so the way it started was, is I I reached out to, there's a person I use to schedule my stuff with Dexcom, right? So I reached to that person and I said, um, I would love to get someone on who can really pick apart standard deviation as it relates to diabetes and how these, these graphs are built and how we talk about, because, you know, A1C was, you know, the only measurement for a long time, but now, you know, standard deviation people are telling you is, is maybe more important. And he came on and told me uh, beyond that, that, and here comes my lack of school again, co coefficients of, hold on a second. Look at me. You're like, no, the kids I teach are not that old, Scott. I don't know either. One second. Uh, my gosh. Anyway, John comes on and while I'm looking and he is, much smarter than me. <laughs> and I could tell immediately when he started speaking. I was like, uh oh. So I, I picked a spot on my desk for an hour and a, and a half and stared at it and listened to him like this when he was talking, like trying to keep up. It was, it was, it was like being sent into, it felt like I was being sent into an algebra class for the first time and I only had an hour to learn it. <laughs> and and yeah. I, you know, because I had to ask him follow up questions that were reasonable. <laughs> So, um, so while we're talking, he's like, Scott, I think standard deviation coefficient of variation, time and range, a one C these things together are the story, you know, not just the a one C, which, you know, you hear people say a lot over the last couple of years, or I hear them say it a lot, but it never followed with context. So I wanted more context for it. Uh, even I would tell people, I'd I'd say kind of just like, you know, like James Bond asking for a drink. I'd be like, well, you know, A1C is not everything. Your standard uh, deviation is very important. And then, you know, just sort of Good trail long. off because I don't know what the hell else to say after that. <laughs> you know, like I didn't know what else. And I wanted to know, well, I know now. <laughs> and, and, if you, and if you listen, you'll know too. But you're going to need to listen through some, you know, which I'm assuming to math people was probably like, coloring you know what i mean <laughs> while i'm just Pretty like simple. that guy's telling me calculus <laughs> it was, but it, but it, but he did his best and i and i you know to make it you know digestible um but in the end it was very interesting an hour i was supposed to have him for an hour and an hour and 20 minutes into it because he was sharing his screen with me yep. i couldn't see my clock and i just suddenly thought oh my like what time is it you, you know, so I, I, I yep. looked down and I was like, I'm keeping you, you have to go. And, and it, the time flew by, like the description of it probably sounds so dry and boring, but I really enjoyed like having the conversation and I hope other people enjoy listening to it honestly, because I think he's right. Like he talked about, there's this number in your clarity, uh, coefficient of variation. He said, if you keep that number under 36%, you greatly decrease your chance of low blood sugars. And I was like, get out of here. Are you serious? Like all these numbers mean something. <laughs> um, so that was just really interesting. Uh, but, but nevertheless, to go back a little farther, hopefully your children will never hear this. Why did the birth of your first child not make you want to be a better parent? <laughs> no, I, th- I would have thought about it. <laughs> for sure actually i just gave him a blood prick tonight because he was drinking a little bit too much and going toward a bit too much tonight the first child <laughs> but i oh, know i just i don't know maybe i was thinking it with the first one i just came you know a bit more in that second Hit one you harder. Yeah. i was like i was like god i hope he doesn't say you know to be honest the first one's kind of a prick so I, <laughs> i'm just not really you know i mean if i'm not around for him whatever <laughs> but the second one i really like i'll tell it's you a good man, question what a good what a good kid you know um but i i understand how old were you when you had your first uh, uh 29 
ish. Yeah. yeah. I have to yeah. tell you, I don't really think this, uh, I don't, uh, you know, I don't want women to take too much of a win from this, but I don't think I was really a human being until my early 30s, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Like, yeah. I was just a machine in my 20s after I got married. I was just like a machine of doing things that I thought my wife needed or wanted. Like, do you know what I mean? Like building a yeah. life, that kind of feeling. Um, I don't think I got to the point where I was like, I wonder, you know, who I am. You know, like that didn't hit me until 31, 32, 33. I was like, I wonder if I could maybe pay attention a little more. Um, but I hear what you're saying. And I, and I, I think the same thing um, through this pandemic. I, 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 purposefully i recognize when the COVID 19 thing came and they were like everybody get in your house i was like uh oh i'm gonna get fat like that was <laughs> like my first thought i was like i'm gonna weigh 50 pounds more than this when this is over and yep. i thought i can't let that happen and so i i did some simple stuff that obviously i could have done forever i went to uh um uh, intermittent fasting schedule of eating you know cut yep. out a couple of items not much took some oils like processed oil out of my life, like simple stuff that obviously I should have been doing forever and wasn't brain surgery. And I lost, I've lost 11 pounds so far during this That's whole thing, but it wasn't, thank you. It wasn't for me. I never once thought I wish I looked better. Um, I don't know how this will sound, but I don't think of myself as how I look. Like I think of myself as like what's going on in my head, if that makes any sense. And my thoughts are me in my opinion. Um, but I really did start thinking about, you know, my kids are going to have to go on for a while. And I, I don't know. I had a, something going on. I talked to my mom. My mom's 76. And I thought this was valuable. Like, I learned something talking to my mom today. Like, I want to be available for my kids yeah. to talk to me, you know. Um, hopefully. Hopefully they're just not, ah, that guy's a prick. Never mind. I don't mean. <laughs> I don't, you know the way you think of your children. Uh, but. <laughs> Just one. <laughs> well, in fairness, the other one's terrific. Uh, but, you know, so I, I was kind of doing the same thing, and I really hope I can keep doing it. I think I found something that's very workable for me. So I don't I don't see how I'll have trouble uh, sticking to it. But I understand what you mean. So, so once you decided you wanted to be there for your second child, um, and, and you got this advice from the doctor to go into the community, you said you found some books. What books did you find? Uh, I read uh, Think Like a Pancreas, which is Gary Schneider's. I think you've interviewed him before. I've never had Gary uh, on, but Jenny works for Gary. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. that's what I've heard. Yeah, yeah. Um, that Bright, Bright Spots and Landmines book, who Adam. you have interviewed, Adam. Did they help, those books? Yeah, they, they did. They did. Um, uh, I don't do a lot of reading for my own sake, for my, for myself, mm -hmm. um, for, for work I do, but, um, I did, I did learn a lot there. Like, like I said at the beginning, I didn't even know what a carb ratio was. Like I, I was, I was basically, I kind of thought of myself as just being diagnosed all over again. I was getting all this information and I, because I was interested in wanting to learn about it, it was, it was sticking in my head. Right. Um, and then, you know, fr from there it was, you know, trying to listen to people online and everybody else's opinions and things with stuff. And um, it just kind of got too much. People just conflicting things that they'd say, Oh, that was the other book. Um, the Berns Bernstein's diet one, whatever that one. Oh, is. you thought about maybe doing low carb at some point. Well, it was just another book that I read and, and I, I, you know, I tried it for a little while and it was great, but you know, I, I enjoy a uh, beer too often or, or <laughs> I don't know. I enjoy carbs too, too often. So it was just like, it just, it worked, but what's it was just for dinner? It was for me. Yeah. What's for dinner? It's a ribeye steak again. <laughs> yeah. He bought a whole cow. He stuck it in a freezer. He's chipping a piece off every night. <laughs> bacon, bacon, and, bacon, and bacon. <laughs> please don't yell at me. Low carb people. I know there are other foods that are low carb. I, um, <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> and I think by now people who really listen, like if you stumbled on this show on this episode, and heard me say that, you'd be like, there's another person saying, I don't think low carb is not a good option. I think that whatever people like are comfortable with that works for them yeah. is a good idea. Absolutely. I'm not a nutritionist. I couldn't tell you if one thing's better for you than the other. I mean, you heard me try to do percentage of 300 of the other men. I still don't have the answer. Uh, so, um, <laughs> but what I, what I always really think and I hold dear is that you need to understand how insulin works so that whatever 
eating system you come up with, you can you can stay ahead of your meals. You know, like you just need to understand how insulin works and then do whatever you want after that. I honestly don't care. Um, but so you took all this information in and what what do you think the first like adjustment you ended up making was like what got you on like what is your a1c now uh as of three weeks ago it was 5.9 wow and i was on that was mdi i was because i've only got the pump for about two weeks now so um wow yeah my educator my educator said when i got the pump and told her that she said what are you getting on a pump for you're not going to do better than that so say, I said to her, "Oh yes, I, said, I will." <laughs> I said, "Just wait and just wait and see, <laughs> lady. I got a podcast, and I'm just going to tell you yeah. right now, I'm going to get Have you a five. Head of Scott, <laughs> I'm get you a five five. You just hold on to yourself a little bit longer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, that's that's very. I'm mean, first of all five nine on MDI is is terrific. Um, and the books, I I can't you know I can't say a bad thing about any of the books that you found. Um, but let's be honest, it was the podcast that really fixed it for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely! Yeah. You're you're the mate. You're, you're the man. Yeah, no. It just got to the point where it was just like I might have a little bit of information, but I don't really know how to apply everything. And I suppose you know a lot of your analogies and things. You, your tug of war one gets me every time you, you mention it. It's, oh, I'm glad. When I heard that the first time, it just just clicked, and it was just you know I've just got to give it a bit of time and a bit of bit of a head start and. Mm. You know, I won't have those spikes, and and I don't now, which is great. Do you know? Have I ever said how that where that tug of war, like, thing came from? Oh, you, I can't remember. No, I no. was so a lot of what I know, a lot of what I understand about the podcast was made more. I enriched it by talking to people privately. So I had these ideas, and I would write them on the blog, and then the podcast, you know when the podcast started even, and I still do it now, but it's almost like an exercise for me at this point. But back then I would do, I would have a lot of conversations with people. What would happen is like through social media, someone would probably be in the same exact situation you found yourself in online, desperately trying to figure out what's going on. And someone else who had read a blog or, or something would say, Hey, you know, this guy, Scott will help you if you message him. And so when people message, they start sending, I don't know if you've ever tried to message diabetes management back and forth, but it's just, it's too much and too much gets lost in writing. And so I would tell these people, why don't you just call me because we can, you know, we can bang this out in 45 minutes. I genuinely believe that if you're motivated in about 45 minutes, I could probably fix your A1C. (laughs) You know, like, it's not like, it's not that because I've, I've, I kept honing it like getting that conversation down shorter and shorter and shorter. There might be people listening now that were like, oh my God, my call with Scott went like, you know, an hour and 15 minutes. That was before I got really good at it. So, um, it's, so it ended up being practice for me. Like, I know I wasn't practicing on people. Like I wasn't saying stuff that I didn't know, but like the way I would say it would, would get refined. And one day I was speaking with this, um, very young mother of a child with diabetes and the woman, gosh, she was so young. It's almost hard for me to call her a woman because I can, I can, I know, you know, who my daughter is at, at 16 years old. Um, she was young. She had dropped out of high school to raise her child. The kid gets diabetes and she finds her way to me. And I explained to her how to pre bolus in a way that I thought was crystal clear. And I was just like, I've done it. This girl understands. We're going to get off the phone now. There's this little pause. And she says, I'm sorry. I don't understand what you're saying. And I felt really defeated. I was like, I'm going to have to get off the phone with her. And she's not going to have an answer. And then that made me feel terrible. So I just literally said to her, hold on a second. I'll think of another way to say it to you. And I just got quiet for a minute. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. Here it is. And I used to talk about, like, I used to tell people, like, imagine scales of justice, but there's little holes in either side of them. And you're pouring in insulin and carbs on either side, but they keep draining out the bottom. So you have to put in a little more carbs and a little more insulin to keep these scales balanced. And it was the way I used to think about it. But when I said it to her, she was just like, I don't know what you're talking about. So I said, imagine a tug of war. And I started talking. And now... 
you know, when there's been times where Jenny's like, that's like the greatest way to explain it to anybody I've ever heard in my life. And she's like, I do it personally. That really touches me because Jenny is incredibly good at talking to people about their diabetes. Um, much better at it than I am, I think. Uh, but, but I just, it resonates. It's very cool to hear you say all the way across the world that, that it was valuable for you too. I'm really glad about that. Um, in the end, I just figured you've got to distill these ideas down so far that they're unmistakable when people hear them. Um, yeah. You know, because it's not an academic endeavor, your life with diabetes. It's happening to you. You know, you need to be able to like, how do I pre-bolus this? How do I take care of this on the move while you're raising your children? And, you know. It's just not a mathematical equation you get from some of those books that just like. Right. It works clinically. It works. But, yeah. but it's not. That's not life. No, yeah. it's, 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 it's not the way you do that. Um, that's very cool. So you've been at this now the better part of a couple of years, your A1Cs and the fives. What kind of pump are you getting or got? Uh, I got uh, the T-Slim. Um, no, no Omnipods uh, in a, in Australia. Um, so that was the next best, best option. And yeah, it's going good. Cool. Yeah, I'm liking it. That's excellent. Yeah. Um, it's a good, it's a really good pump. Are you going to use, um, do they, are, are they offering you the, uh, um, the algorithms? Yeah. So I, th- cause we're, we're still on the G5 here in, in Australia. I think the G6 is due for August. I think I, I read somewhere recently. So, um, obviously we can't do the algorithm stuff until we get that, but, um, I was thinking I probably would, uh, give it a go. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm I'm doing all right without it. So you certainly are. We'll we'll, we'll we'll see how we go. You really, really are, actually. So you mentioned this earlier. Do you have a fear that your kids are going to get diabetes? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose I do. Yeah, it's it's and and you shouldn't. I you shouldn't because it's it's not the end of the world. You know, <laughs> it's not the worst thing they could have. It it's right. you know. It, it, it's manageable obviously so but but just having you know like i said before i i, I pricked my, my four-year-old's finger tonight and you know he doesn't see his blood too often and you know there was some tears and tantrums because of that so you know having to do that regularly you know i don't you know i've heard heard parents and stuff come on your podcast before and, and i don't envy the situation it's a lot easier managing yourself than I can imagine having to manage somebody else. I think so too. I've uh, I've laid uh, over top of Arden's legs so she can't get away, and I can hold the the lance and the meter at the same time. When she was little, I'm like, stay still. Um, yeah, if it, ha- if it happens, I'm going to have to find a whole whole different, I don't know, podcast or something that's going to tell me you know, how to manage a five year old or something. Like dig that. a hole, bury him up to his chest. He won't be able to move. <laughs> You'll be fine. That's yeah. all. I mean, that's off the top of my head. It's no tug of war analogy, but it's it's gonna work i'm just telling you i think the government will come take your children by the way if you do that but <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> they'll be like that's enough you can't have them anymore we saw what you did uh no i it, listen the truth is is that it i mean nobody in their right mind wants to poke a hole in their finger and make it bleed and yeah. you know but at some point just like everything else it becomes yeah i mean you're never gonna love it it's, it's i don't think anyone ever picks up a lance and goes i've been doing this for 20 years boom i love it <laughs> they'll, they'll do it they'll tolerate it they're, it doesn't bother them but they're not they're not in love with the idea i don't think yeah um i have to say when i put this dexcom on it really didn't hurt like i always yeah. had to take my daughter's you know description of it when i talk about it but um it was so funny i said to arden i was like why don't you do it like you can stick it on for me like fair is fair like you know what i mean yeah. go ahead and um she got real funny. She's like, what do I do next? I was like, what do you mean? What do you do next? I'm like, you know what to do. And she's like, it's different from this side. And I was like, okay. okay. <laughs> and we got all ready. And I said, just, you know, give me a little pinch up and, um, and push the button. And she's like, I can't push the button. I'm like, just push the button. <laughs> and, you know, so she started making me nervous. Cause I was like, wait, why not? <laughs> and she pushed it. And I went, huh? That was it, huh? Like really fascinating. Like uh, to even call it a pinch would be excessive. And then there was a, a tingle, or I, 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 I wouldn't call it a burn for a minute or two afterwards. Just kind of like it settled in, and the skin got used to it. And then I just didn't know it was there anymore. Yeah. And well, I, I get I get my wife to have to put my decks on because I put on 
the back of the hip and I can't really reach around. And like I said, you know, at the start, it's, I've always done my own jabs and, and taken care of my, myself completely. So, you know, letting somebody else put something like that on for me over the last six or nine months, you know, it's not that it, it doesn't hurt. It's just, I think it's just the anxiousness of waiting and for somebody else to do it because it doesn't happen exactly when you push it or yeah. when you think it's going to happen. I think it's an anxious thing more than anything else. <laughs> yeah. I, d- I definitely see that with Arden. She's still like, I'll talk about it all the time, but like that de- uh, Omnipod clicks as it's, it's like ratcheting. It, it, it's making tension so that it can, you know, fi- it fires a needle in yeah. and retracts and leaves the cannula behind. It happens probably, you know, in the beat of a butterfly wing or something like that. But uh, as it's making that tension, it's like, click, click. And you can see her. She's just like tensing. <laughs> By the time it's done, her shoulders are above her ears. I was like, can you relax? I, and she and we talk about it all the time. I no lie. Arden's going to be 16 in a few weeks. She's been wearing an Omnipod since she was four. Now that math I can do. Okay. So <laughs> if it's every three days, that's 10 a month, 120 a year, 120 times. That's a lot of Omnipods. And yeah. she's still... It's just like, it's clicking. And I'm like, I know, like it did three days ago. <laughs> Does it hurt? She's like, no, nah, not really. I'm like, Aah. so um, it's interesting. You know, it's just, it's human nature. It's hard to, it's hard to avoid. Um, well, did we not talk about anything that you wanted to talk about? Because I'm not good at, you know, um, linear thought. Pro- pro- probably just the fact that, you know, for the 20 odd years or whatever I did, I wasn't really taking great care of it. Just the fact that, and and you don't um, talk about it a lot is the fact you, know, you talk about the long-term, um, the long, the long-term issues with, with high blood sugars and things like that. But probably from what I've realized and, and learned over the last couple of years is, is some short-term problems with high blood sugars is, and I've, because I've only just learned about it in the last few years is the fact that, you know, the, the mood swings, I, I think, uh, having high blood sugars and then low blood sugars and then being high for, for a, you know, a period of time, um, probably all growing up and, and, you know, even into my, you know, 20s, pe- people probably thought I, I was grumpy or moody or angry at them at different times. You know, even people in my family have said it at different times that, you know, learning about it, you know, over the last couple of years that it, it could well, and, and it is, you know, a lot to do with high blood sugars because you're just irritable and just don't want to be around people and things like that. And, you know, just if people understand that high blood sugars aren't, aren't good in the short term, not then obviously not good for the long term, but, you know, your personality can change mm. when, when, when you get high. Um, nowadays, you know, I, I don't get above, I don't get above 10. I don't get above 180. It just doesn't happen very often. So, um, I just feel a lot happier and, and, and easygoing and relaxed. And I, I don't feel like the, you know, the, the grumpy moody type person that a lot of people that I've grown up with think of you as, and think of, you know, yeah. you know and they do, they've said things, oh, you know, Lockie's just grumpy. Don't. You know, don't mess with him now or whatever like that. But you know, it's and you don't feel like that kind of a person. So I'm, no, I'm no, obviously not. No, that, no, I have to tell you that you just hit on a number of things. But one thing that I I really identify with is that um when I'm when I feel misunderstood, it I find it heartbreaking. Like like there's a person I am, and if I'm you know if I care about you and I'm interacting with you and I'm not coming off the way I intend. I'm like, yeah. oh, that's not how I feel. Like, I can't believe they don't see how I feel. And I, I'm more uh, in tune with that because of almost exactly what you just said, although I don't have diabetes. I turns out I was living for a long time with an incredibly low ferritin level. So we're learning more now, but it's very possible that my body does not retain ferritin like other people's do. And as my blood, as as that value drops in my blood, it's very similar to what you're talking about. Like you can get irritated for no reason. Things seem worse. You know, uh, you're, you're more short tempered, tired, um, cloudy, that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, once I figured it out and I, and I got it straight, 
it was my very first thought outside of my own health was, oh my God, like all these people around me think that's how I am. Yeah. And I yeah. just, I was terrible feeling, you know, um, it turns out you were the prick, uh, but <laughs> 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 these kids are fine. Um, but <laughs> I just, I, and, and so is it, has it changed? Like, have you and your wife discussed it? I, I have talked. Yeah, I have talked about it. And, um, I don't know. I suppose she married me, so she must have seen the best of me at some point, anyway. So it's a small <laughs> island, man. She was probably just like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, he seems like a decent guy and all. And I mean, what am I going to do? <laughs> I'm not marrying that kangaroo, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> well, I, well, I think everybody's got it figured out now. You're getting laid more because of the podcast, and your foreplay <laughs> uh, consists of your wife jamming something into your hip. <laughs> <laughs> Is this an after dark special? Or Not what? yet, but I mean, a couple more minutes, and we'd have to cut out the references to your children because that would just be creepy. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but no, I mean, I, listen, man, I I do. It's funny you say I don't talk about it much. I talk about it when I speak live to people. Yep. I um I tell them all the time there is a person you are, uh, you know, at your core, and when your blood sugars are swinging around or are high all the time. You're not getting to be yourself, and that's unfair to you. You deserve to be yourself. You have to figure yep. out how to be you, and that's made even more difficult by the sheer fact that those things are happening. You're low, then you're high, then you swing high, and you feel cloudy. And while that's happening to you day after day, week after week, you're telling me that with no input from a doctor, nothing, even the stuff that's written down feels too academic. While that's happening to you, you're supposed to figure out how to stop it? But that, yeah, that's right. senseless. Like, how are you going to do that? You know, that, that would be like if I put you out in the desert without any water and you started hallucinating. If I said to you, you know, if you drink water, you'll stop hallucinating. Go take <laughs> care of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm in the yeah. desert. How am I going to handle that exactly? There's no water here and I'm already hallucinating. Oh, it's up to you. Fix it. You know, um, I'm really happy to hear that. That's a, that's wonderful. It seriously is. Um, but I'm keeping you up very late. And don't you have to get up tomorrow and. I'm sorry, teach children the through, through no, no, Zoom? No, first, first day back in the classroom tomorrow. The kids are back. We're, we're out of lockdown. Australia doing, uh, we're doing real good. So oh, uh, wow. only two months, two months of re remote teaching and the kids are back for the end of the term. So you're going into, um, a, you're going into school tomorrow? Yes. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm only working part time this year um, just to be a stay at home dad for a couple of days a week. And um, yes, yeah, so I'm starting on a Wednesday. Well, wow, congratulations. That's uh that's great to hear. It's exciting because there's part of me who listens to all this and I'm like, I'm never leaving my house again, apparently. Uh <laughs> yeah. and you know, or I'm gonna be wearing this. Do you guys cover your face when you go in public? Uh in the in the city, a few a few do, but no, nah, it's not that it not hasn't. that bad. I think I think we've only got like four hundred in the whole country no that kidding. are active cases at the minute. Yeah, we've we've done pretty good. That's amazing. So, I the the um, thing I heard recently that really threw me was that Italy says that they're pretty much been eradicated like it's almost like it burnt through the population and it just everyone got it yeah i hate i really do hate to say it like that but it sounds like it sounds like the people who got it and lived lived and the ones who died died and it's over yeah. you know which is a terrible way to think of it but it does sound like that's what happened um yeah this has been a very strange time uh oh it's been weird <laughs> for certain well, luckily, your blood sugar is not bouncing all over the place anymore because locking your house for two months, being a pain in the ass, probably would have got you shot. I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of places. Yeah, no, gu no guns here. No, no shot. guns right now. No, right. Well, yeah. <laughs> Isn't it funny? I used that as a metaphor. Beat with a cricket bat. <laughs> I didn't even mean shot necessarily. I just meant your wife would be upset at you. I don't know what uh, she would do in Australia. Hit you with a didgeridoo or something like that? I don't <laughs> didgeridoo. Didgeridoo. <know> <laughs> All right, man. This was really terrific. I appreciate you doing this very much. No worries. Thanks for having me, man. Of course. This episode was recorded in the middle of June 2020. It is being edited on December 7th, 2020. And because we brought up COVID, I wanted to give you some updated totals. Googling the words Australia current COVID cases, I learned that Total cases in Australia, 27,972. Total recovered, 25,446. Deaths, 908. And because Italy came up, I will do the same. 
Cases 1.74 million, recovered 933,000, deaths 60,606, and Italy began to, they were pretty flat in June. July stayed flat, August it started to creep up, September more into the thousands of cases, October began to jump into two, two and a half thousand. By the end of October, it was at 25,000. They're currently back down to more around 21,000, but they were up in the 20 to 30,000 range there, maybe till mid-November. I'll look at the same for Australia. Australia is interesting. Very flat when I recorded. He wasn't off. There were about 20 cases when I recorded with him, but it began to jump at the beginning of July. They hit a peak in uh, end of July, August, of about 600, and it danced around around three, 400, and then steadily came back down, back into the double digits in September, and remains there today. There are seven cases in Australia on December 7th. So I just thought that could use some clarity, because what we thought we knew about COVID in June turned out maybe not to be right. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G-V-O-K-E-G-L-U-C-A-G-O-N dot com forward slash juice box. Further thanks are due to the Contour Next One blood glucose meter, which you can learn more about at contournext.com forward slash juice box. And of course, touchedbytype1.org. Check them out right there on their website, on Facebook or Instagram. 